Hola. 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 Topics that were somehow touched upon in the previous talks. One uh, about you know uh, heterogeneous systems in which each cell somehow is doing something different, which is, you talked about, Roberto, and um, and transcriptional networks, which was the second the second talk. Um, so the first in the first part, I will discuss a little bit the inference of network directionality, which is the issue of causality. For example, what we heard from Andrea, I think, basically. Uh, uh, the, the susceptibilities give you a sense of which one, which arrow goes in which direction, right? So, but in general, it's very difficult to do this uh, with, when you have actual data and to know what are the physical interactions between genes that somehow make one gene act causally upon another. So we'll discuss a little bit that. Uh, that. And then we'll discuss um, how the uh, abundance of organelles, like for example um, mitochondria in the case that we are going to discuss, um, changes the decision, for example, for cell death by apoptosis by different cells. If you, different cells have different organelles, different amount of mitochondria, then they might go to apoptosis at different times and we want to quantify that. Let's first talk about the network inference. and. Uh, uh, we, we are in a, a, a biological network conference, so I don't need to um, advocate much about the need for some sort of network of interactions to give us some scaffold of the mechanisms. Though it's easier said, said than done, we don't know exactly how it's, uh, to, to, to map those networks of interactions um, in each cell. But that's what we want to do when we do uh, network inference. Um, Many of the methods to infer networks are very ad hoc, and we'll discuss a little bit of that in the next two or three slides. And there is, there is always this thing about how do we know that the network that we infer is correct? And to, today we heard that, for example, under different assumptions, you might infer different networks, you know, whether it, it is by uh, sequence specificity or by, uh, you know, uh, electros uh, electrostatic interactions and so on. Oh, uh, electromagnetic interactions. So, um, so benchmarking uh, will be also a little bit of um, uh, uh, emphasis that I'm going to make in the first two, three slides. Who knows about the dream challenges? I know you know. Dream challenges. I invented them. So. And the reason why we worked on it is because we knew when we were working on network inference that you can say pretty much whatever you want, and uh, maybe if you find a two or three examples in the literature that justifies what you said, then it will be published, but then that, that may be you know, more noise than, than actual information, right? So we did every now and then in the, in the DREAM challenges, DREAM stands for Dialogue for Reverse Engineering Assessment and Methods, and in several of them, this that I'm going to discuss here for, for um, I, I want to refer to just a couple of, um, uh, results. Uh, it's about, it was something that we did, I think, in, um, in 2012 or so. And uh, what we wanted to do is to see whether um, people were able, given that we knew the network, whether people were able to produce inferred networks given gene expression data. And so we produced several, um, pro provided several data sets including an in silico generated data set or um, transcriptional um, data from E. coli or from yeast and also from um, Staphylococcus aureus. And we invited many, many teams to, to test their methods on this and we would evaluate them. And the interesting thing that I want to discuss is that uh, in, the different, uh, in the different networks, uh, in the different systems, uh, the, the type of method that would make the best inference would, was different. That, uh, for example, in the in silico, it was a regression method that was the best one, but the, in the E. coli, it was a, um, um, 
random forest network, uh, uh, network inference method that did, uh, did it. In the yeast was mostly um, random, as you can see. But um, the, the important thing is that there is no one method that gets it all because the methods are very ad hoc, right? And you can see here that when you try to cluster the methods according to some, um, some uh, um, you know, way of doing it in, in, uh, using PCA, some methods appear to be similar, uh, even though they are created by different teams and with different you know, basic concepts. But I want to focus basically on the fact that mutual information or correlation-based methods uh, cluster together. And, and, and the notion is, in this case, it's relatively straightforward and simple, is that if two, um, two genes that I'm trying to say whether these two genes interact are correlated across many, many conditions. Uh, for example, you have a cohort of patients which have some particular, um, for example, we did this in cancer, about that some uh, different types of um, you know, specific um, uh, in, in terms of the cancers, and you look at two genes, and they co, um, you know, th their distributions are somehow, um, um, the mutual information is high, or the correlation between these genes is high, you, you might say, oh, then these two things might be correlated, for example, in the way that we heard before, not necessarily talking to each other, right? And, and, uh, and then you have to say, okay, but there are many indirect correlations because it's A talks to B and B talks to C, A might appear as talking to C, as we said, so in the previous talk as well. And, uh, and, uh, so, so, and, and we don't want the A to C, because there is no direct interaction between A and C, right? So we need to do some sort of data processing inequality or some breaking the triangles, but that's a little bit dirty. So we want to discuss how can we do this in a, st a, a, a slightly different way, more elegant or basic principle, though there are many uh, assumptions that we will have to make, and in which probably are wrong in many cases, right? But so I want to discuss this particular paper in which we are trying to think you know, how the dynamical network there might be used in order to infer the connectivity between genes, but using the variability that comes from the fact that there is intrinsic noise in the, in the system. And noise in terms of um, uh, gene expression, for example, if you take um, the gene expression of a gene in time, you will see that it fluctuates, and we saw something like that before, and so uh, those fluctuations somehow are correlated, and then we want to have the structure of the correlations inform something, like we said before, uh, the, the adjacency matrix in the graph of interactions. So basically, the idea is the following. Suppose that we have, and we will show experiments about this in a second, that we have a system which is, oops, um, here, uh, you have some ligand, and depending on the amount of the ligand, you might have more of information uh, transmitted through this phosphorylation cascade. And, um, and so if, if, if there is some noise uh, affecting this, um, you know, this, this protein, which is the kinase for this other protein, uh, you know, the noise in one will affect what is going to happen in two, and so somehow the blue fluctuations will in, uh, you know, be responsible in part for some of the fluctuations that we see in two. And, and then there will be some mutual information or some correlation between uh, these fluctuations and these fluctuations because one is causally uh, inputting uh, conditions on the other. But if you put if you look at the noise in, 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 in these two, what will happen is that what happens in two will not go up and you know go upstream of this because there is no causal um, you know interaction between two and one going from two to one. So we want to you know somehow use this basic idea to to think um, to think a little bit more about. Um, how this propagation of noise somehow can be used in order to infer networks that are a little bit more causal than before. So um, there were uh, experiments done, you know, in a very um, seminal paper by uh, Van Oudenarden 
uh, in 2005, probably some of you will know them, in which you have basically two genes controlled by the um, abundance of IPTG that represses gene one. So, um, uh, and so what happens here is that uh, gene zero here represses gene one. If you put more IPTG that represses the repression, then w when you are more IPTG um, in the system, then gene one is going to go up because IPTG represses the repression. And at the same time, gene one is um, repressing gene two, so uh, the more gene one, right, the less gene two, um, and so in terms of IPTG abundance, it's a double neg negative, so. Um, and in terms of the um, uh, kinase cascade that we said before, uh, we will perturb the system with PMA in a, in a T cell, jerk T cell, and um, we will see that, you know, when you have more phosphorylation of, of, of MEC, you will uh, some, uh, you have more uh, PMA, you will have more, more phosphorylation of MEC, and more, phos more phosphorylation of MEC will create more phosphorylation of ERK in the typical MEC, MEC ERK cascade. So we will discuss a little bit those very simple, you know, two gene kind of network and see how this helps us. Um, in terms of not about the perturbation that we said before that we have IPTG or PMA affecting the transcriptional cascade or the kinase cascade, here we have gene one and gene two and the more gene one you have, you are kind of traversing uh, as you increase the IPTG, the point where the system is operating and so the fluctuations in gene one and, and gene two um, have different covariance depending on the point of uh, operation that you have. The same is true for MEC and ERK. Here is in log scale the phosphorylation levels of MEC and of ERK and you can see that uh, depending on the amount of PMA you have you are traversing this transfer function uh, with different covariances and studying these covariances we want to say something but, but how is how is that done by the way it's important to to notice that all this is done in in log scale um, when we look at the phosphorylation of MEC and ERK, we do it in flow cytometry and what you look at is the amount of uh, fluorescence that the the system uh, reports in which you, you put, you know, uh, fluorescent labels for both the phosphorylated MEC and ERK. And so it turns out that when you take the uh, log scale, the distribution of fluorescence are, is, is normal-like. And the same is true for the fluorescence at the single cell level uh, that Van Alden Arden measured uh, with gene 1 and gene 2. So the distributions are going to be normal. So therefore, our variables and dynamical equations will have to be written in log scale. And, and this is what we do here. So usually we say that if you have abundance of, um, of um, you know, entity I, which could be the phosphorylated level of MEC or the transcriptional abundance of a gene, gene, gene one or two, that will, uh, and this is a, the log of that, right? The log of that. And so this adjacency matrix AJI says how much the abundance of I in, uh, influence the presence of, uh, you know, the production of J. And this we saw in one way or another what we had done before. And so you can write this simply, and, and some of these will be degradations, right? So, so the a, AII will be a minus lambda factor, which includes the fact that systems are degrading. And you, will, you, you can very well criticize the fact that I am writing this in a linear, uh, context and what I am thinking is that there is a fixed point where things live and then there are fluctuations around that, the, the, that fixed point and I am linearizing about that. So I'm going to be assuming then that uh, our fluctuations are not so big that the nonlinearities are starting to um, take effect. 